So um, welcome everyone for, um, and thank you for attending um, what I've been called, I'm told to call a decanar, which I absolutely refuse to, it's a webinar um, on defending data protection claims. Um, what I wanted to do today was really look at um, uh, some themes and cases that have emerged over the last two years or so, um, and, and hopefully provide some assistance um, to those of you who defend um, these cases. There are still lots of these cases um, about. Um, and and what, I say what, what we want to do today um, is, is really give some thought to how um, these cases can be defended, how to obtain cost orders, um, and how best to get the result for your client. Um, so defending data protection claims, um, if we have the first slide, um, rather conventionally you start with the pleadings. Um, as with all cases, um, the particulars of claim, um, if you look at 16.41, requires um, um, the pleading to be a concise statement of facts upon which the claimant relies. Um, there are some, there are some uh, specific provisions, though, in relation to data claims, which um, bear some consideration. So the practice direction at 53B provides at uh, paragraph 2.1 that statements of case should be confined to the information necessary to inform the other party of the nature of the case they have to meet. Such information should be set out concisely and in a manner proportioned to the subject matter of the claims. Now, so, as, as someone who reads a lot of these pleadings, um, it, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, very, it, it's something um, that's not always the case that pleadings are concise. Um, they are very often the, the very opposite of concise. Um, but the practice direction goes on um, to tell you exactly what the particular claim must contain. So if you look at um, chapter, uh, section nine of the practice direction, the particular claim must specify the legislation and provision that the claimant alleges the defendant has breached, specify any specific data or acts of processing to which the claim relates. So pausing there, the particular claim must say specifically what data has been processed. Um, that is something that's not always the case because very often the, the claimant doesn't um, know precisely what has been done and, and you get a very general um, pleading um, relying on inference but um, the practice direction is clear that the pleading must specify the specific data that has been processed um, and it goes on. Um, specify the spe specific acts and omissions that to amount to a breach and the claimant's grounds for that all allegation and specify the remedies which are sought. So that's um, a very specific set of criteria that the particular claim must fulfill to be um, a, an appropriate pleading in this area of um, the law. Um, and what happens if there is a, a, a problem or, or the particular claim fails to comply with the rules and practice directions? Well, we saw a recent illustration of this in Pipe and Brock and the LSE, um, only a few months old. Um, it, it's fair to say that there was a lot going on in that case, but certainly um, a, a, a portion of the, uh, Dr. Pipe and Brook's claim um, related to data, alleged data protection breaches. And Williams J, um, when dealing with the defendants, the, the various defendants' allegations, or sorry, the various defendants' applications to strike out parts of the claim, noted that absent a coherent pleading, it is not possible to determine whether an arguable claim could exist, given the extremely vague nature of what is alleged here. No arguable claim is identified at present um, and went on to strike out um, large parts of the claim. Um, so conventionally do start with the particulars of claim, do start uh, and read those um, with the practice direction open to make sure that the pleading complies with um, the requirements of the practice direction. Um, I should just say um, before um, I'm told off um, by anybody that um, you, you, there is time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you do want to put any questions into the Q&A um, box, I will, I will try to keep an eye on that as we're going through this and, and, and try to take it um, at a convenient time. Um, you, you often get uh, not just a, a data protection claim, but a, a claim um, alleging negligence, misuse of private information, breach of confidence, um, running alongside the data claim. Um, why it is um, for 
um, claimant lawyers to pick a single cause of action, an appropriate cause of action, and run with it. I'm not entirely sure, but certainly you do see very often um, negligence claims running alongside a, a perfectly proper and a perfectly decent um, DPA claim. But um, it, that is wrong, I would suggest. Um, and we've known it's wrong since 2013 at least, and the case of Smeaton and Equifax, where Lord Justice um, Tomlinson um, said this about the suggestion that there was a coextensive duty of care in the tort of negligence. Um, it will be obvious given the DPA provides a detailed code for determining the civil liability of data controllers arising out of improper processing of data. So you don't need to pray and aid um, the tort of negligence because the um, liability for data controllers is set out um, in either the um, 1998 DPA in the 2018 Data Protection Act or in the UK GDPR. So if you if you see a, a negligence claim asserted, um, there are options of what you can do. And one um, way of dealing with it, we saw recently in Warren and DSG um, retail, um, was to apply to strike it out. And um, Mr. Justice Sinai, um, considering Warren, um, considering Smith, sorry, um, goes on to say imposing a duty owed generally to those affected by a data breach would potentially give rise to an indeterminate liability to an indeterminate class. Um, so there is no um, negligence claim that um, is applicable in these sorts of cases and do think um, very hard about whether it's appropriate to strike out such claims and obtain um, a cost order. Um, Warren is an interesting case um, in some ways because um, what happened, the facts of the case are quite simple, that um, DSG retail, um, it, it, in essence, is Curry's, um, and they obviously have um, data on hundreds of thousands of their customers, and they were subject to a, um, a data hack. They didn't do anything. They didn't misuse any data. They, they didn't um, process the data in, 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 in any inappropriate ways, um, but they were subject to a, um, a, a, a hack. Um, and the claimant, or Mr. Mr. Warren, um, knowing that his details have been compromised by this hack, brings a claim against DSG retail to retail um, in negligence, um, misuse of private information, and breach of confidence. Um, and Warren says some very interesting things about um, MPI and VOC. Um, and it's important to remember that those torts are not the same as a, a claim under the UK GDPR or the DPA. Um, there must be a misuse. Of that information and this led the claimant um, in some difficulties. Um, I, I, we've already had some questions submitted to us um, and I noticed that one of the requests was to deal with um, um, misuse of private information and breach of confidence. It, it, it's, a, it's a whopping great big subject um, so, so we, we can't do very much of it today but um, it's worth bearing in mind what misuse of private information is. Um, it's born out of Article 8, and there you see on the slide, I, I set out Article 8. So everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. Um, then Article 8 to there shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right, except such as in accordance with the law, and is necessary in a democratic society in the interest of national security, public safety, or the economic well-being of the country, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health and morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. And out of this comes um, this idea of the misuse of private information as a, as a um, standalone tort. And you see the quotation from Campbell um, from 2004. Um, English law has adapted the action for breach of confidence to provide a remedy for the unauthorised disclosure of personal information. This development has been mediated by the analogy of the right to privacy conferred by Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights and has required a balancing of that right against the right of freedom of expression conferred by Article 10. So that's how we get to MPI. A um, couple of points to remember. Um, MPI is a distinct tort from breach of confidence. It's not the same thing. Um, and that was confirmed recently by the Supreme Court in Bloomberg. Um, it's also important when, when thinking about MPI to bear in mind what um, the tort is trying to protect, what rights the tort is trying to protect. Um, and the issue with MPI is um, 
in, in essence, whether the information is private. Um, it doesn't matter whether the information that is published or disseminated or, or misused is true or false. Um, what the tort seeks to do is protect um, privacy, in essence. So it doesn't matter whether it's true or false um, in MPI terms. Um, when we think about MPI, um, there are two distinct questions that need to be asked. Um, the first is whether the information was private. So did the claimant, objectively speaking, have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Um, that's an objective factual question um, that you need to ask, ask and answer first. Now, some information um, is presumed or, or there's a starting presumption, a starting idea that um, some information is private. So health information is private, your GP records, your um, hospital records, things like that, that's private. Um, personal relationships, information about finances, um, the fact of an arrest, whether you've been arrested, um, that is all private and that was the Bloomberg case we saw recently. So there's a starting presumption that such information is private. Um, but what of information, uh, other sources of information um, that might not fall within that um, starting framework. Um, well, in answering questions, you, you look at what are known as the Murray factors. So you look at the attributes of the claimant, the nature of the activity in which the claimant was engaged, the place at which it was happening, the nature and purpose of the intrusion, the absence of consent and whether it was known or could be inferred, the effect of the claimant, and the circumstances in which, and the purposes for which the information came into the hands of the publisher. So looking at all those factors, you'll be able to get a sense of whether the information which is the subject of the claim um, was private, whether objectively speaking, the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy. So if you answer the question, that first question affirmatively, you then have to look at the second question, and it's only then you go on to the second stage of the inquiry, um, about whether or that, but if Article 8 is engaged, um, you have to consider whether there's been an infringement. Um, in essence, can you justify the use of the private information? Um, that always involves a balancing act. Um, it should be borne in mind that Article 8 doesn't trump Article 10. One um, right is not more important than another. Um, so you really have to give some thoughts to whether you can justify um, the use or the misuse. Um, of that private information. Um, very quickly, um, I will touch upon um, breach of confidence because you because you see these running in tandem often, although not always correctly. I would suggest. Um, so, how do you get a breach of confidence claim going? Well, the information must have the necessary quality of confidence about it. Um, trivial, useless information is not going to attract that quality of confidence. So if the information does have the necessary quality of confidence, the next question is whether um, that information was imparted to the defendant in circumstances obliging an obligation of confidence. So what, what, how did the defendant come to um, obtain this information? In what circumstances was there an expectation that um, the information was going to be kept confidential? And then thirdly, there must be an unauthorized use or disclosure. So like misuse of private information, um, the defendant has to um, use the use that information, use the data um, in an unauthorized or inappropriate fashion. But there has to be a use, which is why um, when we get back to we go back to Warren and DSG retail, um, the claims for MPI and breach of confidence are struck out. Um, with the court saying this, in the language of Article Eight, um, there must be an interference by the defendant which falls to be justified. I have not overlooked the claimant's argument that the conduct of DSG was tantamount to publication, although it was a transfer we presented, I do not find it persuasive. If a burglar enters my home through an open window and steals my son's bank statements, it makes little sense to describe this as a misuse of private information by me. Recharacterizing my failure to lock the window as publication of the statements is wholly artificial. It's an unconvincing attempt to shoehorn the facts of the data breach into the tort of MPI. Um, so, um, in this case, and in many cases that, that you might see, um, 
there's a perfectly good data protection act claim or an arguable data protection act claim but alongside that with the coextensive claims for negligence um, misuse of private information and breach of confidence um, it is important um, I, it seems to me to um, look critically at those um, causes of action and if they are inappropriately pleaded um, then um, in appropriate cases um, there might be maybe some force in applying to strike out um, those inappropriate causes of action um, and obtaining a cost order or, or, or obtaining a cost order against the claimant. Um, not only that, um, you see how overlapping causes of action are dealt with in cases um, like Johnson and Eastlake community homes. Um, now, what happened in that case was that the defendant inadvertently sent um, the claimant's rent statement to a third party. That was it, nothing much to it. Um, claimant issues proceedings in the High Court um, seeking damages um, uh, under the GDPR, um, a declaration and claims for misuse of private information and so on. Um, guess before Master Thornet. Um, who says this in the judgment? Um, Taking the claim as a whole, the breach of confidence claim and the claim in privacy failed to satisfy me that they had anything useful and independent to the claim arising from the admitted breach of the GDPR. As such, I agree with the defendant's submission that claims collateral to the GDPR claim are likely to obstruct the just disposal of these proceedings and take up disproportionate and unreasonable court time and costs. They are struck out under CPR 3.42b and by the same reason, they should be excluded under um, 3.12k and or m. Um, so what's interesting in, in this case, and what's useful in this case, is um, even though there is nothing wrong with an argument that um, what the defendant did amounted to a misuse of private information, amounted to a breach of confidence, um, you might not get home on it, but there's nothing wrong um, with it as a, as a use, using that cause of action, the court was still willing um, to strike out um, those causes of action um, as affecting the just disposal of the proceedings because they, they added nothing. You didn't need to have this argument. We were, the defendants already admitted the GDPR claim. Um, it really is just a simple matter of uh, once that admission has been made of trying to work out what the claim was worth. Um, so you don't need to litigate. Uh, misuse of private information. You don't need to litigate breach of confidence and the court was willing to strike those cases out. Um, not only that, um, so not only does the defendant get um, a cost order having successfully struck out um, large portions of the claim, um, Master Thornick goes on and um, say, mindful that the court should strive to provide a remedy to any litigant it can to fashion a procedure by which the claim can be adjudicated in a proportionate way. The claim ought not to be entirely struck out, but instead redirected to the more appropriate forum, the county court. Everything about this case has all the hallmarks of a small claims track claim that should have been issued in the county court and so allocated. The suggestion that this is a developing area of law, or where uh, even if principles established requires elaborate and complex legal argument, is unrealistic, if not at least arguably opportunistic. So the defendant in this case um, strikes out significant parts of the claim and because they add nothing to the overall claim um, gets it sent back to the county or gets it sent to the county court and get it gets it sent to a non-cost bearing track which um, overall is not a bad result and you see um, a, a similar result in Ashley and Amphilion um, again all that ha happens in this case factually is um, the defendant employer um, sent the claimant's um, contract of employment to another employee. Um, that's really it. Um, and the court takes this approach. Um, so the claimant can't be criticised for putting all causes of action open to him. So this isn't a criticism. There's, there's nothing wrong with um, bringing uh, or seeking a claim for misuse of private information, breach of confidence, and so forth. Um, but as a matter of proportionality, an issue to which I shall shortly return. There is no need for a cause of action to go to trial, which could only succeed if the more appropriate and convenient causes of action, cause of action, which I'm about to consider next, succeeds. So you don't need, there's nothing wrong with it, but you don't need to bring your claim for misuse of private information or breach of confidence. You have a perfectly good data protection that claim. Um, that is your appropriate cause of action. 
and the court can, in appropriate circumstances, strike out um, unnecessary causes of action from the uh, Jamil principle, but the court goes on. Um, next, I agree with the defendant that the claimant has no prospect whatsoever of achieving any remedy at trial other than damages. As is customary, the pleading includes a claim for a declaration and an injunction to restrain repetition of the data breach. Mr. Finn is right to submit that these remedies will be wholly superfluous and pointless. Um, so what does the court do? Um, useful to point um, this out to claimants. In conclusion, I will not deny the claimant access to the county court, probably the small claims track, to litigate the claim, particularly in circumstances um, where the defendant appears not to have reeled the whole of its hand and has, at the same time, sought to rid itself of the action in a manner that prevents its disclosure obligations from arising. So, again, lot of the claim um, struck out, cost order obtained, and the case um, goes to the county court, probably allocated to the small claims track. Um, again, um, more recently, um, similar outcome in Stadler and Curry's group. Um, all the defendant does is resell a customer smart TV without performing um, a data wipe. Um, the claimant brings breach, uh, claim for breaches of the DPA, MPI, breach of confidence. So again, not just Data Protection Act claim, which would have avoided um, the hearing at all, um, would have avoided any adverse cost orders, but um, throws an MPI, throws in breach of confidence. That is our Judge Lewis um, sitting as a uh, High Court judge. Strikes out the MPI um, breach of um, confidence claims as inadequately pleaded and amounting to a claim for data security. Um, strikes out the negligence claim, allows the DPA claim to proceed um, again in the county court with a recommendation that it should be allocated to the small claims track. So there is a trinity um, of useful cases that um, not only provide support for the idea that you can strike out um, unnecessary causes of action, um, but that these cases um, are really suitable, or, or in the vast majority of cases, these sorts of um, claims are suitable, um, not just um, for the county court to deal with, but um, an allocation to the small claims track. Um, so you've looked at the pleadings, um, made an issue out of that potentially, um, perhaps struck out an uh, MPI claim, perhaps struck out a breach of confidence claim, struck out the negligence claim, you're left with a Data Protection Act claim or a GDPR claim um, with the claimant saying that they were um, terribly upset by this breach and they want some money, which uh, takes you to Rolf and Veal Wandsbrook. Um, and again, what happens in this case is that um, a solicitor at the defendant firm sent a single email uh, to the wrong recipient, um, very close names, get, they, there's, a, there's a letter wrong. Email goes to the wrong recipient, the recipient, third party, um, emails back saying, um, I don't think this was meant for me. Bill wants to email back saying, terribly sorry, can you delete the email? Third party says, yes, of course I can. Um, they tell Mr. and Mrs. Rolf, um, and the claimants um, bring a claim again in the High Court, um, saying they're terribly upset, um, and, and it all gets um, sent down to the master's corridor. Um, the claimants say, we value this claim at about £3,000. Um, they wave in their hand um, a cost budget for um, £50,000, which um, perhaps a touch on the optimistic side, um, and the defendants apply to strike out um, the claim. It's common ground uh, that damages can be recovered in data claims um, for distress, even absent pecuniary loss. So um, it, it's um, a bit of a head scratcher, really, for um, common law lawyers um, that you can get your claim going um, without proof of any damage, just asserting um, that you, the claimant, is upset. But you can do it, nothing wrong with it. Um, but you've got to prove it. Um, the claim can't succeed where the loss or distress is not made out, so the claimant doesn't prove that they were upset. 
or that such distress is um, not more than de minimis, is trivial. Um, interesting quotation um, relied on in the case from Sir Geoffrey Vox. Um, I understood it to be common ground that the threshold of seriousness applied to section 13, so that's section 13 of the 98 Act, as much as to MPI. That threshold would undoubtedly exclude, for example, a claim for damages for an accidental one-off data breach that was quickly remedied. Um, so I, it's just not serious enough. Um, and Master McLeod goes on, and you get a tenor of what the master is thinking um, from the language. Um, we have a plainly exaggerated claim for time spent by the claimants dealing with the case and a frankly inherently implausible suggestion that the minimal breach caused significant distress and worry or even made them feel ill. In my judgment, no person of ordinary fortitude would reasonably suffer the distress claimed arising in these circumstances in the 21st century in a case where a single breach was quickly remedied. There is no credible case that distress or damage over de minimis threshold will be proved. In the modern world, it is not appropriate for parties to claim um, for breaches of this sort, which are frankly trivial. The case law referred to above provides ample authority that whatever cause of action is relied on will not supply a remedy in cases where effectively no harm has credibly been shown or be likely to be shown. Um, so again, another good day for the defendants. Um, seems to be unarguable that there was a data breach in the case, um, but um, the court um, comes to the view that the claimants will not be able to prove that they were more than trivially distressed by it, and the claim is struck out. And no, sorry, and not only um, is summary judgment awarded in favour of the defendant, but the claimants were ordered to pay the claimants' cost on the identity basis. Um, due to the nature of the claim in terms of exaggeration and lack of credible evidence of distress, um, and that the court regarded the claim as speculative, given its de minimis nature. So some ways um, you can deal with um, those sorts of cases, so look at the pleadings, um, look at the causes of action, um, look at what is being claimed in terms of um, distress and how credible that is. Um, we will come back, I think, um, at the end, perhaps, to um, uh, think a little bit about um, claims for psychiatric or psychological harm. But um, you see a trend, I think, um, in the way the courts are dealing with these sorts of cases um, and how sensible the courts are being. Um, uh, and I, I think there is a real sense that the courts don't want um, a, a flood of trivial cases clogging up um, the court list. Um, I, I, and we are seeing this trend, I think, um, which is all to the good for um, defendants. Um, moving on to vicarious liability. Um, so you, you're left with um, a data protection act claim you're left with a more than trivial um, claim for distress um, possibly claim for special damages as well um, are you liable um, for the actions of whoever was responsible for the data breach um, vicarious liability we know um, it's not controversial um, it is a concept that is applicable in um, data claims and again, another very recent case, Ali and Luton Borough Council considered um, vicarious liability in the, concept, in, in the context of data claims. Um, and, and what happens in, in, in Ali um, is the, uh, the claimant, um, so Mrs. Ali um, complained or went to the police um, and, and made allegations of domestic abuse by her former husband um, in a fairly standard, um, safeguarding uh, way the police shared that complaint with the local authority. Um, slightly unfortunately um, an employee of the local authority uh, was now in a relationship with um, the claimant's former husband um, and even more unfortunately we thought it was appropriate to access um, the records that have been shared by, with the police or by the police. Um, and thereafter shared certain documents, not with, with the ex-husband, who in turn then tells other people within the community about um, the allegations. 
Um, and you can see why, in these circumstances, um, the claimant was upset. Um, and she sought damages from the local authority, bearing in mind that um, their employee only has this information or only obtains this information because of her job with the local authority. Um, so, so the case, is, it, when it gets to trial, is solely about vicarious liability, and it's heard by Richard Spearman QC, who's sitting as a um, High Court judge, and applies in his analysis the principles set out in various claimants and Morrisons. <coughs> um, um, and, and, as, and as Lord Reed's comment is this, whether the wrongful conduct was so closely connected with acts the employee was authorised to do that, for the purpose of the liability of his employer, it may fairly and probably be regarded as done by the employee while acting in the ordinary course of his employment. There's a distinction between cases where on the one hand the employee was engaged, however misguidedly, in furthering his employer's business, and cases where the employee is engaged solely in pursuing his own interests on a frolic of his own. So that's the distinction um, that you need to consider. And in the case of um, Ali, um, the court comes to this conclusion. Although Ms. Begum gained the opportunity to access and process data relating to the claimant and the children by reason of the unrestricted access to the local logic system, which she was required to be afforded in order to perform her role. Um, so here's what I said. She owed Mrs. Begum, um, the employee who caused the data breach, um, only has this information because of her job. Um, it formed no part of any work which she was engaged by the claimant to do to access or process those particular records. Indeed, if Mrs. Begum had disclosed her connection with the claimant's husband, as she ought to have done, her access to these records would have been restricted by the defendant. In doing what she did, Miss Begum was engaged solely in pursuing her own agenda, namely divulging information to the claimant's husband with whom she had some relationship. Further, that was to the detriment of the claimant and the children, whose safety and interests as users of the defendant's services it formed part of Miss Begum's core duties to further and to protect. So, case dismissed. Um, the local authority not responsible for the actions of um, Miss Begum. Um, again, another um, good result for the defendant. Um, that really is um, a summary of some of the trends um, in defending um, these cases. Um, they are positive for defendants. Um, you certainly, um, in my experience, are still seeing lots of cases being intimated. Few of those cases that are intimated um, actually make their way towards litigation, but of those that are litigated, um, you have an, a, an idea of how you can approach defending these cases, how you can approach um, misuse of personal information, breach of confidence cases in the context of a, of a coextensive data claim, how you can approach negligence cases, and how you can perhaps think about striking out elements of cases, obtaining cost orders, getting cases um, transferred um, to the county court. Um, we have had um, some uh, questions. Um, of those that were um, sent in before today, um, um, one is, are you seeing an increase in psychiatric injury being pursued in data breach claims, um, including expert evidence? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, largely because of the cases that we've um, talked about today. Um, in order to try to get around um, cases being allocated to small claims track, um, increasingly you see um, claims being advanced for personal injury, um, saying that the data breach has caused some sort of psychological reaction, um, and, and you'll get a um, psychologist or psychiatrist report um, saying that it has caused some sort of adjustment disorder, the, the breach has caused some sort of adjustment disorder. 
Um, so it, it, it is on the rise. Um, I, th I think courts are fairly live to the notion that um, relatively minor breaches of the Data Protection Act could cause psychological damage. Um, but it, it, it is a, an argument that is increasingly being run um, and, and can be dealt with in, in relatively conventional um, ways by questions to the expert or, or um, potentially being a bit more robust and trying to obtain your own expert evidence um, about these sorts of things. But um, it, it, it is a trend that is um, on the rise, although um, I, I suspect some courts will give it rather short shrift. Um, a related question um, is what happens to costs um, in uh, DPA injury cases? Um, and the question, uh, as, as I read it, is whether um, what happens to costs, whether it's a fixed fee or um, as in fixed cost regime or um, um, uh, standard costs. Um, I, I, I had a, I looked up um, the pre-action protocol for low value personal injury claims um, or public liability claims um, before starting today. And it's, it's worth um, looking at the definition of um, public liability claims and what is said in the protocol um, at section 1.118, a public liability claim uh, means a claim for damages for personal injuries arising out of a breach of a statutory or common law duty of care made against um, someone other than a claimant's employer or the claimant's employer um, in respect of matters arising other than in the course of the claimant's employment. So um, what, what's important is not the cause of action, um, but what the claim is being made. So it seems to me that if, if the claim is for personal injuries supported by a, a psychiatrist's report or psychologist's report, um, that would arguably fall within um, the pre-action protocol for low value personal injury claims. Um, and what would flow from that would be um, the attendant cost consequences for fixed costs. So um, certainly arguable if we are going to be seeing um, more of these um, sort of low value personal injury claims um, were with the suggestion that a, a breach of the Data Protection Act has caused um, uh, some sort of psychological reaction that, that those are arguably um, covered by the fixed cost regime. Um, uh, there was a question or, or, or a plea um, for misuse of private information, something to be said of uh, misuse of private information, breach of confidence. Um, I, I, I've dealt with that um, in some ways. Um, there was a request also to deal with um, such subject access requests and redaction. Um, that really is um, a, a, a whopping big topic. Um, I and um, Sarah Prager actually talked about this on an earlier video. Um, so do feel free to try and dig that out. It'll be on the website. Um, if there's any specific questions about um, subject access requests, I can, I can try and deal with them now. But um, um, I, I would um, point you in the direction of, of the previous video, if, if I may, or do feel free to um, contact me. Um, just send me an email if, if you've got any specific questions about subject access requests. They are difficult um, because um, there, there is a, a right for a data subject to obtain um, his personal data and to obtain um, other information about um, how their personal data has been um, processed. Um, it's also complicated because there are different regimes in the UK GDPR and in the 2018 Act. So it, it does take a bit of juggling, but um, um, all I can do is, uh, at this stage, I, I think, point you to an earlier video. Um, question, would cases like these be okay to do on a CFA? Um, yes, matter for you. Um, I take it that's from claimant, solicitor. Um, they are run on CFAs, uh, entirely matter for um, your risk analysis, I suppose. Um, just looking at some of the questions we have, um, read DJ Sinai's hypothetical scenario in Warren and DSG. Um, 
I, I, I think, uh, Mr. Justice and I, um, I will be best pleased to have been um, relegated to district judge. But um, um, could it be argued? Could it be argued carelessly leaving the financial documents vulnerable to theft is in fact a misuse? If there are steps the data controller could have taken to ensure the documents um, and so on, that that's basically um, what what the the kind of argument was. Um, the answer to it is, is, or the answer that the court comes from Warren is not really. Um, what the claim was really about, I mean, th this is something that's covered by the Data Protection Act. Um, you, you have to take suitable steps to protect the integrity of the data you, you're processing. Um, not, not taking steps is not a misuse. Is you're not proactively doing something. There needs to be an interference to engage, engage Article 8. There needs to be a unauthorised use and breach of confidence. Um, these aren't um, torts or equitable remedies. Um, that concern data protection um, questions. Um, the, the proper um, cause of action um, is under the GDPR or the Data Protection Act. Um, so th I, think, I think that was exactly the argument that the claim was trying to run without much um, success. Um, can you please explain the contents of an MPI claim, please? Um, I'm not quite sure um, what the question, uh, sorry if I'm being a, a, a bit dense, I've got, I've got my, my little COVID adult brain um, isn't perhaps working, but um, when a misuse of private information claim is in essence, um, as I said, um, there is some information over which the claimant has a reasonable expectation of privacy and objective expectation that the information will be kept private. Um, and then the defendant uses that information. And classically, this was um, a publisher um, who um, published a salacious story about um, a, a celebrity um, going into rehab, as um, uh, one of the cases had it, um, or publishes some information about a, a private a, a private life or um, Max Mosley in a dungeon, whatever it may be. And then the question is, can um, the, the, the use of that information be justified um, given that the claimant has an a, a expectation of privacy? So that the two questions we, we thought about, the first question is, is there an objective expectation of privacy? Um, if the answer is no, that's the end of it. If the answer is yes, the second question is, um, can you justify um, can you justify the use of or the misuse of the information? Um, sorry, my, my mouse seems to stop working, so rather ungainly. Um, I will go on. Um, um, if there is a PI claim that has been concluded, um, then an individual makes a subject access request to see what is held by the defendant about them as these emails contain, uh, containing unpleasant comments about them sent internal in the organisation, does that amount to a breach of confidence if distress is claimed? Um, the PI claim was for historic abuse by a former employee and was settled. Um, that is interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I'm not sure the information, um, that those unpleasant comments um, would have the necessary quality um, of confidence about them off the top of my head. Um, rather, I mean, these are very sort of fact dependent um, situations, but um, people saying um, silly or unpleasant things, I'm not sure that amounts to a breach of confidence because um, one, I don't think the information has the necessary quality about it to attract the protection of um, the tort. And I also don't think, um, well, in, in what ways was this information imparted? In, uh, I, I suppose it, it, some information came to light in, in the course of the um, litigation, but I, I'm not sure that necessarily would attract the protection. Um, it's an interesting argument, though. I, I'd love to know more about it. Um, another question. Does the judgment in Drive on Crown Prosecution Service where the High Court claimant was awarded £250 
sort of reach at the lowest end of the spectrum go against these trends. Um, well, I, the trends really were um, in large parts um, about cases being allocated to the county court or small, small claims court. Um, and, and you saw some judgments where um, the judges were saying, well, I, I don't think there's much to this, um, but we, we, you, we, we should strive to um, fashion some sort of way of vindicating your rights. And the way that is done is, is in the small claims track. Um, it, it's not solely in the Rolf sort of case um, where judges are saying, I, I just don't believe you're going to be stressed about this. Um, these are what you're trying to do, I suppose, is to compensate for subjective distress. Um, that's a very fact sensitive um, analysis. And as always, different judges and different courts will come to different views about um, what is appropriate. Um, but I don't think it goes against the trend, it is just um, an example um, of one court coming to a, a, a view. But it's an it's a interesting case on quantum to um, use, it seems to me. Um, when considering distress, how long after the breach would you expect a client, a client to discuss the effects with a GP? Um, I actually very seldom see cases where, even in cases where um, there is a psychological report or a psychiatric report, um, it's it, fairly rare to see um, claimants going to their GP about these things. I mean, it does happen. I have seen it. Um, I also remember one ongoing claim at the moment um, involving a police force where the claimant goes to his GP um, and says, um, I'm not coming here because um, I want you to treat me. I'm coming here to record the fact that I'm coming and I'm upset by this. Um, so you have to be aware um, how self-serving some of this can be. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't put a huge amount of stock necessarily in a claim of going to see their GP. Um, um, you, know, you, you can deal with these in, in a you, you can attack these sorts of entries in a conventional um, way by noting how self-serving it all is. Um, can you ask the claimant lawyers listening how they possibly contribute to the world in bringing these bullshit claims? Um, well, any claimant lawyers listening, please um, do enlighten us um, in the comments section. Um, will the slides be shared this afternoon following the webinar? I think Emma is um, on the call and she will, um, I'm sure, share um, these. Um, I can certainly ask us to do that. Um, I would be interested to know if you feel a photo short video of a baby in a hospital should be classed as special category data on basis that their racial or ethnic origin can be determined even though their face isn't really visible. Oh, that's got the sound of someone who's got an interesting case. Um, I think it probably is special category data because you're right, it does reveal um, racial or I suppose it reveals some racial information. Um, I, my instinct is that it, it is special category data, although I'd have to um, have a think about it. But do e everyone um, listening, please do um, email me if you have any um, other questions that we haven't addressed. Um, I don't know if there are any other queries um, outstanding. I don't think so. We still haven't heard from any claimant lawyers how they possibly contribute to the world. Um, I think that's a bit unfair. Um, but I, I like how forthright um, the question was. Um, so if there are no other questions, let me just check. Um, the common regarding bullshit claims is that's a nonsense. Well, yes, um, I will take no view on that one way or the other. Um, but I, I will leave it to other people to discuss. Um, it's entertaining, nonetheless. Um, right. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope um, that was of some use. Um, genuinely, if you do have any questions, um, please do email me um, and I'll do my best to answer them um, in relatively short order. Um, but we have had, we're coming up to, I'm nearly on the, on the minute. 
Um, so, um, in the few seconds before it gets to one o'clock, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, please do, um, as I say, email me if you have any questions. I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much. And um, I will leave you all to go and have some lunch now. Um, good afternoon, everyone.